Well, welcome to the Tuesday, March 13th informational. And we have a number of items on the agenda. But uh, the first item, we have a UDC report from Councillor Rolfing. This will be my last UDC report, so I'm kind of looking forward to it. Uh, we got, how much time do I have? Uh, we're looking forward to it too, Councillor Rolfing. You're, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, this won't take long, although we did have a very full agenda out there. Um, the, uh, we, we approved some uh, TIP, uh, Transportation Improvement Program, revisions um, and unified work program. Those are just basically uh, federal government type uh, programs that needed to be uh, shifted or changed a little bit to make sure that the work got done. Um, we did some public participation plan approvals for both the coordinated public transit and for unified plan work. And basically those are set up so that you do, you do about 10 or, 10 or 12 different things for each project. You, you get the project together and then you take it out to the public two or three times and then you do this and then you come back to the public again for the final and then get it approved through the, uh, through the report or through the uh, committees. And so it's uh, something that's real formalized and, and uh, it's, it's a good program to have. Um, we did defer uh, Section 5310 program funding um, because of some shortfalls that we saw there and that'll be done in the next couple of months. Um, there was another TIP revision, um, another guideline. Uh, they also have a performance measure operating procedure agreement, which basically says how the transportation, the South Dakota DOT does their, does their job and uh, measures how things, are, uh, how things come out. Um, then a unified plan um, program also. Uh, Year-end report from the Sioux Falls MPO. I am happy to point out that I was the only one on the committee that had perfect attendance. So I felt very good about that. Um, there was some uh, minor update in that uh, Amber Gibson, who is the uh, director for most of the MPO things that we had, has been uh, hired by the city of Sioux Falls. And so we have, uh, we appointed a new one, Lynn Keller Forbes, so we'll be, we'll be doing that. Last thing kind of on the agenda was uh, Minneapolis County's pavement measurement system. Uh, that's the same thing that we do in Sioux Falls where they drive every mile of the road both ways uh, in the county and determine whether it's good, fair, poor, uh, or really needs to be taken care of immediately. 77% um, of their roads were in good to very good uh, condition. Only 2% needed to be replaced, and they were really happy with that, and so was the gentleman running it um, who reported on it. was really done well, and uh, this thing gives, like, like ours does, says, we don't necessarily take care of the things that are the roads that are in worse condition now. We sometimes uh, will do the ones that need to be um, uh, taken care of so that regular maintenance is done. That's cheaper than <clears throat> waiting for everything to go down the tubes and then having to do it, do a great big job on it. So um, it was very interesting. Uh, they'll be working on that uh, through the summer. Uh, and then lastly, the 85th and I-29 interchange has been uh, uh, has passed the environmental study. So that is still moving along nicely and will continue to. If anyone would like to see my notes and things on it, I'll have them up here, happy to share them with you. And I'll answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Councillor Rolfing? It's your last opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it was covered very well. Councillor Rolfing, I'm going to miss your reports, actually. And thank you very much for doing a great job. And, and congratulations on your perfect attendance. You should have at least received a little gold I, star I, for I, your lapel or something. That's what I told them, or, or maybe a little cash, but that didn't work that way. No, I, under, uh, I understand that uh, since Amber is, has left and is now part of the city of Sioux Falls, you, you stated Lynn Keller Forbes will be we'll filling be in for filling Amber. Filling in for her at this point until they hire somebody they hire. in okay. her position. Right. Very good. Councilor Rolfing, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Okay, now we're at the point for City Council open discussion. Do we have any items for open discussion? Councilor Neitzer. Thank you. I've um, been really busy today, so I'll probably forget what I wanted to talk about, but a couple things off the top of my head. I did go visit the alligator. It wasn't near as uh, impressive as I thought it would be. It's smaller than I thought, but uh, anyway, so there is an alligator in town, and I did <laughs> visit a number of other creatures. There was a lot of creatures at this place. 
uh, arachnids and snakes of all sorts and toads and lizards and so very interesting it was kind of a, a menagerie so um, anyway so continuing to look at that the animal ordinance the other thing I did want to mention was about um, the sound issue and I will say in general I did have a very uh, a very nice presentation that I had requested where health set up a basically a demo for me so I get to hear 55 decibels 60 decibels 65 decibels and it was very useful because we can talk all day long about 55 as a normal conversation and 60 is a vacuum cleaner or whatever it is but until you hear it and also the doubling of the sound 55 to 65 to actually hear what a doubling of the sound really sounds like so it was very helpful so I'm looking at at some various options and it was it's encouraging to hear what I've heard in the terms of the case and I won't talk about that because that's still ongoing but looking like it's hopefully coming to a positive resolution but um, it was it was very useful and I, I really appreciated it so I'm just continuing to kind of look at that so that's all I have for today Thanks. okay thank you very much Councillor Staley well uh, first of all I, I just I have something else to say, but Councillor Neitzer, maybe you could tell us you were actually in some of those units. Is that correct? Next, across from the Icon Building, so you got to hear the noise coming through. I I did uh, invited in by the owner, that, so I did get in a unit. Yes. Okay. So I and I think that kind of thing would be helpful to all of us to be able to experience if we're going forward with some kind of a change, so that we can actually hear you know what these people are hearing and. Uh, see it for ourselves. So thank you for doing that, and, and I would welcome that opportunity to have that experience as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I got a, <coughs> a little cough here. Well, what I want to talk to, to about during my little chance to have, this is actually kind of our public input time for the council, in my opinion. But um, I attended a funeral this morning of Hal Wick. Many of us know him as a, a legislator. He's had 20 years of service and we're talking about super citizens which is great I think that's wonderful and I, I was sitting at this funeral it's the fourth funeral I've been to in 10 days for some reason and I've got another one tomorrow but lots of people dying but I will tell you it can be a glorious experience going to a funeral of someone who is prepared and they said that Hal had made preparations for his death while he was in the hospital so it, it really was a wonderful experience <clears throat> But what, what hit me as I was listening to this beautiful homily done by Father Robert Fox was he said that Hal mingled his Christian values into public service. And they talked about Hal's tenacity and his persistence. Those are two words that have come up for me in this last week. Um, they said that Hal repeated things over and over and over again because he thought these things were so important. He was striving to get the right things done. And Father Fox said that you never said no to hell. He came after you. So he really was a guy who tried to get things done. And so I just wanted to, to point that out, that it was a very inspirational. And I also wanted to talk about a placard that I, I would encourage everyone in our community to read. It's on the south side of our city hall. And I ran across this several years ago, and I read it, and I was like, wow. I was so inspired about the, the challenge that our forefathers had to go through to take us into statehood. A lot of people aren't aware of this, so I wanted to read this. Um, on September, is that the first page there, Jim? I think that's the second page. Whoever is first page after two decades of presidents appointing governors and other officials from outside the territory a statehood mo movement began in the 1880s in the southern half of Dakota Territory the movement was led by a small minority group of middle-class reformers who wanted elected offices for themselves they called for a convention to meet at Sioux Falls to frame a constitution enabling the people who live south of the 46th parallel to develop a state government and to make application for admission into the Union. Germania Hall was the only building in the territory deemed large enough to accommodate the expected 150 delegates. Built on this site, the 1882 story brick building, and by the way, this is the site where our city hall is, uh, contained a large auditorium with a balcony. 
On September 4, 1883, an all-male delegation gathered here to begin 15 days of deliberations. Representatives from Minnehaha County, including local notables R.F. Pettigrew, Melvin Grigsby, and W.W. Brookings. The delegates produced a lengthy constitution with, with, with changes became the basic law when statehood was eventually granted. However, territorial governor ne Nehemiah Ordway, who opposed the division of Dakota Territory and backed the One Great State Movement, failed to approve its enabling legislation. As a result, Congress later refused to divide Dakota Territory into two separate entities. They could have quit at that time, but they didn't. A second constitutional convention held at Germania Hall convened on September 8, 1885, using the 1883 document as its model. The assembly made only one significant change. The new state's northern boundary would be four miles south of the previously adopted demarcation line. In a spirit of com comradeship, on the last of day of the convention's 14 working days, delegates, many of them Union Army veterans of the Civil War, sang marching through Georgia. There was a spirit of activism in these people. A major change in national politics had occurred a year earlier. Democrats swept the national election and controlled Congress for the first time in 20 years. Because of fear that statehood for Dakota would increase Republican strength in both Congress and the elected college, Congress rejected the second bill for division of Dakota territory and statehood for Dakota. Second time, could have given up, but they didn't. Political winds shifted again in 1888 when Republicans regained control of Congress and elected Benjamin Harrison president. On July 4, 1889, constitutional delegates assembled for a third and final time in Germania Hall. The bulk of the work having been done at the previous two conventions, the delegates only had to change the name proposed for the new state from Dakota to South Dakota to reapportion the judicial and legislative districts and to arrange with the prospective new uh, sister state of North Dakota for an equitable division of territorial debts and records. On November 2nd, 1889, South Dakota achieved statehood, the 40th state admitted to the union. And so I just wanted to say that because uh, we, we're talking about bringing back the repeal of the funding for the, for the legacy development contract and, and I'm kind of like Hal Wick. I'm going to keep saying it and saying it. I think if something is, is something I believe in, I, I'm going to go to any length I need to, to to help it happen. So just wanted to give that as a kind of a background that there are many instances where, where persistence and tenacity have paid off for the benefit of our citizens. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Counselor. Any other items? Counselor Erickson. Thank you. I just wanted to offer my condolences to the Wick family as well. Um, I was in the legislature with Hal, and um, he taught me a lot in my short term, uh, my two-year term when I was there. And Hal was just a great person. He was a great mentor. Uh, he worked hard. He fought for what he believed in. And um, he certainly will be missed in this community. And it's safe to say that he's probably touched every person's life in this room at some point point or another, and um, we'll surely miss Hal Wick. So um, my condolences and all of the council to the Wick family. Thank you, Counselor. Any other comments for open discussion? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on then into our first presentation, which is actually a follow-up discussion of the 2017 year-end financial report uh, from our informational this past February 27th, and Director of Finance Tracy Turback is back by popular demand to, to do a follow-up. Welcome. Yeah, I run into this all over the place, you know. <laughs> Just can't get enough of me. <laughs> well, I'm here to answer questions. If you have follow-up questions from a couple weeks ago, I'm happy to do that, so. Very good. So the floor is open. Councillor Stately. Okay, well, and, and some of these questions you've answered, but I, I, and I appreciate that, but just for the sake of uh, public information, um, and I've got a, a few here, so if, counsel, if someone else wants to ask some, I'll just ask a few to start with. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask last time, um, with, with David Fifely leaving the attorney's office, and his salary was, I think, around 180000 thereabouts, 
what what happens is that's prorated I'm sure right he his salary ends when he leaves yeah we quit paying him when he quit working okay so so <laughs> then that goes back in just into the operational fund or is right. that just it's, extra the, the city attorney's office is funded out of the city general fund and so any unspent dollars in the city attorney's budget at the end of the year just the, the budget lapses and the, those dollars stay in the general fund so that maybe helped a little bit with although in the big spectrum of things Hundred thousand probably mm -hmm. isn't going to be it. Okay. Um, then I noticed on page six of our little uh, handout here, you had. Let me go back to this. Uh, we were talking about um, a, the general fund revenues. You had license and permits. The actual was six point two million. Um, does that in, license? When we talk about license and permits coming in, is that including fines as well? It just seems like sometimes there that fines are kind of so I'm on page six there at the top yeah, graph any kind of fines I believe would fall into that other category other down below right that wouldn't okay fine that, that would capture a lot of the kind of miscellaneous types of revenues that flow into the general fund okay and then I'll ask one more and then we'll pass the plate um, and then we're talking, and I, we talked about this before, and people have asked me this, but just for clarification, when we're saying we have, let's say we had eight million, well, this isn't even, how, how much did we have in um, building permits last year? How much? Yes, do you know that kind value, of roughly? Yes. The value of the permits issued? Yeah, it was like astronaut. It was we're, over we're doing, 700 million, I believe. Right, record break. Okay, so if you have 700 million, people are asking, how does that actually flush into uh, to supporting city funds, mm -hmm. city projects. What, what does that equate out to financially? Well, it's, it, it would certainly vary on a case-by-case -case basis, but in the overall picture, of course, the mo most important thing is that it's putting pr new property, new development on the tax rolls for property tax purposes. Now, it typically, from the time a permit is issued uh, to the time that the city would actually see any sort of Tax revenues off that improvement uh, can oftentimes be anywhere from two to three years, sometimes perhaps longer. So it takes a long time for that property to get, first of all, it has to be constructed. Permit comes before it's constructed. Uh, then it needs to go through, through the uh, county's assessment process and get put on the tax roll and uh, subject to a property tax levy. And, that, and so there's oftentimes a, quite a lag in time. Okay, and I remember that. All right, so I will, I will yield the floor to someone else. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Anybody else have some follow-up questions for Director Turbat? Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Councillor Star. Yes, Director Turbeck, thank you for uh, coming back and uh, working with us here a little bit to get through it. The, uh, it's a lot of information in a short amount of time that we did uh, here a couple of weeks ago. One of the things that kind of has come to light since uh, you were here the last time is some of the um, changes at the community playhouse. And I'm curious, as part of their debt, I believe you serve on their board, or at least as part of the uh, Orpheum Theater Group, is part of their debt that they're trying to pay off um, rent or fees to the city of Sioux Falls, or have we written some of that off, or where, where are they at um, status-wise? Yeah, of course, the Orpheum, and you're referring to the, the uh, Sioux Empire Community Theater as a tenant to the city's facility, uh, the Orpheum, Orpheum Theater. And that, that facility, of course, is managed by SMG. And so uh, any, any business relationship that the community theater has is not directly with the city, but rather with SMG as the city's manage, management company. Um, I don't know the exact status of their uh, account with SMG. Uh, I do believe they are in arrears to some degree and have not paid for all of the, uh, uh, the charges that have been uh, I have been billed out to them, but I can't tell you for sure just what the status of that is. Is that something you could follow up for us and we can certainly respond by out. email, I think, or mm -hmm. to the council to let us at least know where they're at? I think that's uh, important to the community to know where they're at and uh, that way. Are there any other um, entities that may be behind or as part of the 17 budget that uh, did that? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Canary Zoo, Pav oh, Pavilion doesn't pay rent, but uh, they manage the facilities for us. But whether it's 
canaries or any of those groups that would be possibly in arrears? Well, over the course of, of a year, um, there are a lot of entities that the city indirectly does business with in our entertainment venue, so I'd have to believe that there are probably some accounts that are delinquent, but uh, nothing that uh, nothing that's top of mind or of significant concern that's been bubbled up to, to my level. Perfect. Um, and then one more in a different direction. Um, during your monthly report that you give to us in our year end, do you include the uh, bid district uh, revenue that comes in and how that fluctuates monthly? I don't. I was trying to pull up my uh, copy from this month and I don't have. I, just ran out of time to do that, but do we track that? Each, I mean, obviously we track that each month, but is that something that comes as part of the monthly report? You're referring to the uh, the CVB's business improvement district, the two dollar a night bed tax. Yeah, the, those dollars flow through the general fund, and so they are identified uh, within our uh, books as a general fund revenue, and then essentially as an offsetting expense within the general fund. So it's essentially a pass through. Those dollars, the revenues did come in below budget last year um, during 2017. I can't say off the top of my head just how much they were below budget, but uh, that just is fewer dollars passing through then to the CVB. So that equates to probably lower occupancy because the tax is paid based on well, the occupancy? Yeah, I don't, I don't believe the revenues actually went down. They didn't hit the budget amount. So they were, they were still up over the prior year, but they weren't up as much as the budget would have reflected. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor. Yes, Councillor Erickson, and then we'll come over to you, Councillor Robley. Thank you. I just have one brief question. And with, um, Senate, with session coming to an end, there were some changes made to the TIF uh, rules as far as needing a TIF dashboard. And I know we've talked about that and um, asked um, David Bixler, our finance uh, guy, to be pulling together some of that information for the council. So I'm curious if that's still in the works, where is it, or if you could just give us a, just a brief update as far as what that will look like. Yeah, I'm not familiar with all the details of the legislation, but uh, we, we did provide a lot of information to the Department of Revenue uh, as that bill was making its way through uh, through the legislature. I think pretty much everything uh, that they asked for, we had already compiled, uh, you know, as a uh, result of a request from from uh, you, Councillor Erickson, and some others on the council that were looking for that information. So, as far as I'm concerned, I think this that type of dashboard information is pretty readily available. You know, and it, typically it doesn't change a lot from month to month. Right. It's because, I mean, it's really driven by the two property tax payments that come in each year from those underlying properties. And so it's really only, uh, really only changes when property tax payments come in and then the, the obligations are, are paid or perhaps a new TIF district comes into place and, and there are some dollars that uh, trans, uh, transact at that point. Perfect. Thank you. And I, my hope is, is that maybe, and I'll make sure I have what I need, but um, if we could just get a maybe updated version of it and then have it included in our annual budget time, just so we're aware. I understand it doesn't fluctuate a lot really with property tax collections, those two times, um, but just having that information I think is, is helpful knowing what it, where it was, where it is now, and how far we are to putting those back on the tax rolls too. Yep, very good. We're happy Perfect. to provide that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rolfe. Um, I just wanted to respond a little bit to uh, Councillor Starr's uh, uh, information about the TIF, the uh, bid bid tax, uh, the two dollars that I know because uh, I sit on that board uh, as a representative of the city that the budget that the CVB does with that is significantly lower than what the city projects it to be, <clears throat> and so the money wasn't spent. I guess would be a good way to put it. The money was not spent before they had it in their in the in the um, in their bank account, so to speak, and and they budgeted for 2018 the same way, uh, significantly <coughs> below what the projection was from the city, on that. So, I just wanted to assure you that they didn't spend more money than they got in. Okay, Councillor Staley. Uh, okay, so Tracy, let's go back to the 700 million in up. Uh, Building permits, which which is going to equate to 700 million more property tax worth value, right? Assessment. It will translate to some more. How much more? I guess is is really difficult to say. Is a a church might come in and get a building permit to put up a church, and that would be included in the value of the building permits issued, but they're not subject to property tax revenue. So ultimately, that in that washes particular out. case, it it doesn't 
benefit the city from the standpoint of generating property tax revenues. So same, same with a school. Um, so those things are all, while they dr help to drive economic activity from a construction standpoint, put people to work and that kind of thing, they don't always necessarily translate into more property tax revenue for the city. Well, and I know and uh, we are, we're including city projects in that number too. They have a right. building permit just like any other project. Yes, yeah. so those again aren't going to be on the tax rolls that, to add to that value. No, it wouldn't so, make much sense for the city to be paying No, taxes, I understand, so. but it's just yeah. people hear that number 700 million and they, you know, they're thinking, woo, we're going to have that much. They don't really understand where that plays, like I said, into the support of our cities. So I, I've got two more things. Um, and we talked about this before, but just in a simple way, tell us uh, what percentage of, of what we pay on our property taxes goes to the city. And that, that will vary depending on uh, which county people okay. are in and which school district they're in. But generally speaking, uh, for property owners within Minnehaha County, it's a little less than 30% of the tax bill goes to the city. And in Lincoln County, it's uh, uh, just a little bit over 30%. So right around that 30% mark of a property owner's tax bill would go to the city of Sioux Falls. Okay, super. And then uh, the last thing is that just to explain, tell us um, what we are paying annually each year in our debt payment for the event center and the administration building. And then on each of those, we got the yearly debt payment. And then how much, how many years we're anticipating making that payment? Mm -hmm. The event center uh, payment, for example, in 2018 is about $9.1 million. And that will, uh, that, that does, I think that's about the high point for that, uh, for that particular bond issue. It will eventually taper down to about eight and a half million, I believe. Um, Number of years. And that will, will eventually, the, the very final payment is in 2033. So there's what, about, you can do the math, teacher. Well, you, you <laughs> so, do the math. So now <laughs> I've never been very good with numbers, you know. <laughs> Okay, okay. The, uh, the administration building uh, is uh, about $1.1 million, and I'm not sure I have the exact, uh, let me get it. The final maturity on that, I believe, is in 2036. But, yeah, 2036, that will be paid off. Okay, that's all for my questions. Thank you. Councillor Neitzer. You know, it occurs to me while we have you here, there was just a press release that went out about the refinance mm -hmm. of the quality of life bonds. Um, compared to what we were thinking versus what we got, how, it looks like we actually got a better interest rate even perhaps than what we expected. Is that correct? What was your feeling of the bond sale? Let's just put it that way. Yeah, well, I'm certainly very happy with the, the rate that we got. We had 11 uh, underwriters that bid on the on the bonds, which certainly wasn't a surprise, but it's always kind of gratifying to see the level of interest in, in the city's bonds, and I think that really uh, speaks to the quality of the, the city's credit. Um, the, the true interest rate on the bonds that we sold this morning came out to 2.14%. Um, we had, when we had been talking about this initially, a month ago, kind of the range, the 2.5% was kind of the low end of the range, so it did come in below, uh, certainly below what had been uh, projected or anticipated. Okay, great. Looks like we've uh, reached an end of our questions. So, right. Director, thank you very much for coming back a second time. We You're do appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. Okay, the next item up is uh, something that we all look forward to uh, doing every year, and that is the Board of Equalization. And so we're going to have a discussion uh, on that topic this afternoon. And uh, our city clerk, Tom Greco, is going to kick us off here. Well, thank you, Council Chair. I'll just kick us off. And uh, at your request, uh, the Council's request after the last Board of Equalization, we've invited the Directors of Equalization for Lincoln County and Minnehaha County Carla Gosen and Diane Ripkema, respectively, uh, to come and just talk in very broad terms about the Board of Equalization process, maybe some key trends or things they're seeing in their particular counties, uh, and give you an opportunity to ask questions. If you have specific questions on the process, 
uh, for when you're sitting down next week doing it, the mechanics of it. Uh, we'll be happy to talk to you about to you about it offline uh, or just before the meetings to kind of refresh your memory on what those spreadsheets look like, what the program looks like, et cetera. Um, but with that, we'll um, have Carla come up first and talk about Lincoln County, and she'll be followed by Diane. Thank you very much. And welcome, Carla. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Carla Gosen. I am the Lincoln County Director of Equalization. Um, thank you for the invite to this informational meeting today. I'm Diane Reichel, I'm the Director of Equalization for Minnehaha County, and thank you for having us. Welcome, Diane. Thank you. So the meeting today is to give you a brief of the Boards of Equalization. So local Boards of Equalization meet next week, March 19th through the 23rd. Um, last week, uh, myself and Diane submitted a booklet of information for, for the council um, for you to review. What it had in the booklet was some definitions about what mass appraisal is, what our job duties are, um, a brief of what assessors do along with the duties of the local board of equalization. I also indicated that uh, the Lincoln County property record card data, I submitted that as well, along with the summary of what we present to the boards of equalization. Um, it's through the PowerPoint system. Remember, Lincoln County does more of a PowerPoint presentation. Minnehaha has um, a, their own program. What I wanted to do today is give you a brief of the reappraisal of Lincoln County, okay? Tom's going to put it up on the dot cam for us all to see. So just keep in mind that mass appraisal is defined as the process of valuing the worth of a universe of properties, which is Lincoln County, as of a given date, which is November 1, and that's set by law in a uniform order, utilizing a common reference of da data. So we value all properties using a similar database, which we use um, Vanguard appraisal um, system. And we use Marshall and Swift. They are both approved by the Department of Revenue. So. so then after we come up with our initial valuation, we do some statistical st testing. And what that statistical testing tells us is um, where our level of assessment lies. Um, it compares our low-valued properties in comparison to our high-valued properties, and that's called a price-related differential. So we want to be, make sure that we're assessing our, our lower-valued homes equally accordance with our high-valued homes, okay? So we do that. That's a central, central tendency that we look at. Um, we also look at a coefficient of dispersion, and what that tells us is how tight our group of sales are in conjunction with that middle. So um, if our coefficient of, di if our level of assessment is 90%, we wanna make sure that a lot, the group of our sales are within that 95 to 85% ratio. So to keep the group tight. Um, Lincoln County started the reappraisal in 2015. Um, we, first started in the town of T in the township of Delapri, which was about 3,000 parcels. We applied those new values to the 2016 assessment year. The first year that we uh, put our, implemented our reappraisal, we had about 400 appeals countywide. Um, the next year, we went in and revalued all of Her the city of Harrisburg along with the Springdale Township. So that was the township that surrounded um, Harrisburg. And at, last year, if you re remember, we had about 260 appeals that we heard countywide. So as our reappraisal values are hitting the books, our appeals are dropping. And they're dropping because... <coughs> were equalized. Even though values have, are increasing to more of a market-based system, they're more equal because we're treating every property exactly the same. So the 2017 year for the 2018 assessment year, we have now entered Sioux Falls. 
we hit about 4,500 residential properties and 500 commercial. All of the commercial has been revalued in Sioux Falls along with 4,500 residential. We got south of 69th Street and as far east as a, I think it was southeastern. So that southern port portion of Sioux Falls is, is what we did for this year. So those are the, we applied those for the 2018 assessments. So for those areas that we weren't doing reappraisals, we put market adjustments out there. So just because you weren't in the reappraisal area doesn't mean you were safe from the assessor. Um, we applied market adjustments throughout the whole county. Um, with your booklet that I submitted on Friday, it, I gave you a complete breakdown from uh, all across the whole county on the percentage of increases um, that we applied. And those depended on area and they were in between 3% and a 15% market increase. Okay. okay, I'm just gonna let you know what to expect from Minneapolis County next week. Um, this year we raised residential properties approximately six to 7%, depending on location and the building type. Those will be heard Wednesday morning. If you could show up about 15 minutes early and we'll go through the program again. It'll be the same system as we had last year. Each appointment is 15 minutes. We've got about a half a day of residential. And then Thursday afternoon, we have commercial. That'll probably last two to three hours. Um, for commercial properties, we went up anywhere from three to 10%, just depending on building type and the location on what it was. Uh, Minnehaha County currently has a value of $15.9 billion on the books. This is before the equalization board process. Um, we were talking about building permits earlier. Through the county, we had 7,566 building permits. Uh, for sales transfers, we had 7,295 with about 4,000 good sales that we use to our establish our market base. And I have a diagram here. This just shows the median sale price in Sioux Falls over the last seven years. And if you look at 2011, it was at 140,000. For 2017, it went to 190,000. So in seven years, the median sale price of a home went up $50,000. Already this year for 2018, we're at about 194. So as you can see, this is all about supply and demand. This is the um, most wanted property. We have a lot of people out there wanting to buy in this price range and the supply is limited. So it's driving these prices up and thus that's why the six and 7% increase also. So if you have any questions for us. Any questions? Councillor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the, the presentation. Yes, we're anxiously, eagerly looking forward to next week, I know. Um, so maybe you said this, maybe I missed it, but of the 4,500 homes and 500 commercial in Sioux Falls that have been redone, um, coming into this year, do we have any idea how many appeals will of that we'll be seeing next week? Is that broken down at all yet? Or I know that living in that portion of town, I've heard plenty about it over the last. Um, as of, I think about noon was the last time I heard from uh, Clerk Tucker. Was Sioux Falls has about a hundred appeals in the Sioux Falls portion of Lincoln County. Um, but don't be, <laughs> that number could rise dramatically in the next two days because Thursday is the deadline to appeal your assessment. And Diane and I both agree that these last two days to submit your appeal is our heaviest days. They're the busiest. Um, they so are yes, so that change. number could double. Yeah, I was gonna say that number sounds surprisingly low, so that's encouraging, I guess, um, but I won't get my hopes up. 
and maybe if you can summarize this or not for the people watching and listening just so they get an idea that don't watch this as far as the process next week you talk about how it's a little bit different between Lincoln and Minnehaha how you evaluate and I know we it was my first experience last year being through the process and you talk about linking Lincoln being more of a PowerPoint versus Minnehaha can you kind of summarize in a point or two what's the difference and why is it different we have the same laws and regulations that we follow. We praise the same. Uh, basically, when Carla started a few years ago, she started where the uh, assessments were quite low. So that's why she began the reappraisal. So we, in Minnehaha County, we try to keep up on the reappraisal so we don't have to make such huge increases every year. Well, am I remembering wrong? Or wasn't there kind of a different way of how it went about or the system of how you got to it? I thought there was, but... No. No? I think what you're referring to, if, if I may um, speak, are you talking about the information we provide for you to make yeah. a decision? It is, it is much different, but it's very much the same. Okay. You're getting a PowerPoint or a paper copy, but it's the same type of information that you're plugging into their computer system that gives you the three comparables. Okay. Um, and that the, they're, keep in mind there, the three comparables are there to establish that's our market range. Those are not the three comparables that we used to come up with the value for that property. They are the three comparables to justify our valuation. That's our, our market range. Okay. So yes, I mean, we supply it with a more PowerPoint system. They have a program. And the reason why you were able to do a program is because you were sitting under the umbrella of technology in Minnehaha building. When, from my understanding, when Minnehaha was doing the local boards of equalization here in Carnegie, it was very similar to what Lincoln County was. But since you were the, under the umbrella of their technology, they've come up with a computer system. Is that correct? That's correct. OK. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Councilor Knight, sir. So before I go to my thing, just to clarify, so methodology exactly the same. It's just that the presentation yes. is just a little different. Yes. It's just a PowerPoint versus a computer program. Yes, That's correct. That's the upshot of it. So um, you, you made a statement about the objection, about people objecting and early in the process. Can, can I take that to mean that if, if I'm one of the first to get the reappraisal, mine might adjust you know, somewhat dramatically, but maybe you didn't get to some of the other people where I say, hey, they have the exact same house, why is mine going up? But as you continue through the process and you get more and more done, it's going to be more equal so people aren't going to have as much objection. Is that what you're essentially getting at? Yes, I believe that is absolutely the fact. You know, um, our first year we, we put on about 3,000 parcels. Uh, the next year we put on 5,000 parcels with the reappraisal. In 17 for the, eight pay, uh, for the 18 assessment year, 5,000 parcels. So you can see our numbers are growing. And we'll, we'll finish Sioux Falls um, in 18 for the, for the 19 assessment year. And you know I think people are confused that, OK, we haven't hit you yet, but we're putting on these market adjustments. That's our, that's our protection because we don't want those people to um, be as hardly impacted as our first year reappraisal was where the values went up 50, 60, 70 percent. So that's why we're doing the market adjustments each year so those folks, when we finally get to them, aren't seeing such a dramatic increase. Sure, the, st the less sticker shock. Yes. Um, so how... Is there a certain amount of time that you wait before you do an actual reappraisal, or is it really a trigger based on where you see that maybe the numbers are so out of whack that you don't have a choice? What, what triggers an actual reappraisal versus just your adjustments? The International Association of Assessing Offers, Officers, there are standards that assessors um, are to adhere by and it's recommended through their standards which we adhere to by the state of South Dakota that a reappraisal should take place every six years oh we try to do a continual reappraisal so every year reappraising something we're we're doing several neighborhoods per year 
Okay, so you're just kind of just continuing it's, to just kind of keep going around. So you hopefully hit me every so many years. You're right, exactly. And then my last one, and then I'll defer, is um, so when you actually do an uh, appraisal, if you if you do an appraisal of my house, are you coming to my house? Or are you going in? What what should somebody expect? You bet. Um, so the first thing we do in Lincoln County is we send a letter notifying you of uh, the reappraisal in your area, and we give you a start date. Um, we don't know the end date because, you know, some, some areas take longer than others. Um, so the, the first step is to notify the owners, and we give them a brief of, okay, the reappraisal is going to look something like this. The appraiser is going to knock on your door. Um, if you're not home, we leave a green door hanger to notify you that we were on your property and to call us um, to make an appointment so we can do a walkthrough. The walkthrough is very crucial because there's a lot of things in the home that we don't know until we get in, um, such as some of the finishes, the, the design and layout, the, the, the basement finishes. Um, we're not peeking in windows to see if there's basement finish in there. That's, um, even though a lot of people say we do that, we really don't. Uh, we don't want to know what's in there because they could be looking back at us, is, is what I tell my appraisers. So you don't want to look in there. Um, so that, that's why we think it's very essential to, to get in do a walkthrough. It takes about five, 10 minutes. Um, I tell people when I'm doing the walkthrough that I'm not going to remember your home. I'm writing down basic information. My appraisers are visiting hundreds of homes a week. They're not going to remember yours, but they're going to write down that you have granite countertops, you know, uh, hardwood floors, uh, two bedrooms, three bathrooms, vaulted ceilings. You know, you get, they're going to know that information. We're not going to remember you had a blue and brown couch and, oh, my gosh, it was horribly decorated. I mean, we're, we don't do that. Um, it, we're just getting basic data on your home. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor Staley. Diane, you said that the training is on Wednesday. You're gonna we come early Wednesday morning, right? And uh, what if the, we're not scheduled? On the Wednesday? local board starts at nine. We will send you out the schedule on Friday when it's finalized. Like I said, the last day to appeal is on Thursday, so we don't have the final schedule until Friday. In case some of us aren't on for Wednesday, okay. You know that I we'll, right. we'll work it out. So let's let us talk about. I got a few things here. Um, we said the deadline is on Thursday. Um, so if someone did want to appeal, how would they do that? They have the option. They go to their local board of equalization in Sioux Falls. Uh, for Lincoln County, they're coming down to the city. For Minnehaha County, they're coming to the equalization office. And they what, fill out a form? They fill out a form. This form is also available online, but they do need to set up an appointment. By Thursday, by the th end of, end by of business five o'clock on Thursday, five o'clock Thursday. Okay. And then um, just go through uh, for people how this because I, I didn't really know how this worked till I did it last year. It was fascinating. So we're going to hear this people are coming in and then explain to the citizens what happens then. Um, either we say no, we, we say we we validate what you've done. Or if we reassess then then where do we go all right so when the people come in they're going to tell you what they think the property is worth and why and hopefully they have evidence to support that we'll have evidence to support our assessment um, if they don't agree with that they can always appeal it to the county board of equalization which the last day to appeal is april 3rd you're saying so if, if we say so if you say no change and they're still not done, happy. Then they can appeal it to that, and then there's another step too, right? They go to that's, the state. That's correct. They can also go to the state office of hearing examiners after the county. And that costs, that can cost them some money? Do they travel. have to? Just the travel. Okay. And then I will say, having been there last year, just to, for people who are doing that, I wish there was some way to get that out to them, but the people who came in with that documentation pled their case more effectively than people who just thought it was too high. That's correct. And, and, and we try to tell people to bring in as much information as you have to prove 
why you don't think it's worth and, it. And even like talking about, um, well, you've got the real estate comparables, but you know, just work that's done or, we, I mean, we had all sorts of scenarios coming at us, but those people, again, who did their homework really had more success. And then um, if, I would, did I, you know, let's face it, the prosperity that we've had maybe works against people a little bit too when they've got these beautiful homes and I see I think they're the ones that you're wanting to get into a little more than like a little starter home like mine but nonetheless mm -hmm. let's say something happens and we've had this great market we just I just put it on Facebook by the way I mean we're, we're up <laughs> we're up okay um, and I know that let's say the market somehow drops as we go forward and that hundred and ninety thousand dollar home now goes back to becoming a hundred and fifty thousand dollar home. It kind of readjusts, which could like could happen. How does how does that play out for you people? We actually did that in two thousand nine, where we lowered values. I think we were busier that year than we were in other years. People did not like their value going down. <laughs> so no matter what we do, well, yeah. we basically can't win. You mean they're, they're because if the value goes down, then your property taxes are going to go down. No, that is not true. The That's city true. and the county and the school district sets their budget. That's what determines the taxes. We could drop everyone's values and your taxes could stay the same if the budget stayed the same. Right, but if your house is assessed at 250000 and mine might be assessed at 112000 my taxes are less. I mean, it's just That's showing. That's correct. And you're trying to get to 90% of market value, right? Oh, oh. Or, or more. Yeah, okay. So I would think, I mean, I'm paying less because my house is... Right. Our job basically is to make sure that the taxes are distributed equally. So we want to get those values equalized so everybody's paying their fair share. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Counsel you. Councillor Starr, did yes, you have a question? Absolutely. One of the, and I'm not sure you could both try to get this, because one of the confusing things for me last year that I tried to explain to a constituent, let's say that there's a house that's assessed for $300,000 right now. They decide to sell that home. I come in, I negotiate, I offer all cash, quick close, whatever. I'm able to buy that house for $250,000. Is that the market value of that house? One sale does not make a market. Thank you. I had told told you earlier we had like 4,000 sales. We use all those good sales. We're doing a mass appraisal. So if I so come we in have and to use all of our sales. But if I come in and appeal and I come in and I say, I paid 250 for this house. That's what it should be. What? What's the response? I get the the part about that you know one sale doesn't make a market, and I understand that. How do you say that I got? Well, I mean, really, I got a good deal. I bought a three hundred thousand right. dollar house for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I just have to pay taxes on what it's really worth. Right, it's and we'll show you comparables of other like houses that have sold for more. No, and, it makes sense. It's, it's just the hardest the thing for board. residents to understand. Right, right. In, in and their, I understand. You know, and that's why we, at the counties, both hire professional appraisers who have standards and able to follow the, that, um, the, the value of properties in the market. So it's okay. not always what that current sale price is or what you are able to buy that property for or how quickly or how slowly you bought that house, too. Because there were people I remember that said, you know, I could, you know, it'd take nine months or a year for me to sell in this price range, and I couldn't get what you're appraising it at, and, mm -hmm. and, and the confusion of understanding that, and I think that's where people, um, well, they obviously become angry in that process because they don't want to pay more in taxes, but they also right. don't want to sell the property for what they wanted appraised at either. So I mean, it's a, right. a balancing act of trying to find that and I more than anything I think the process for me last year was very fair and equitable for people you have trained staff who have the training um, put in the time and the background to do the best they can to assess the overall market so mm -hmm. more of a thank you than a trying to be confrontational but having that as elected representatives to be able to explain that to our constituents I'm sending them to your office next time so <laughs> thank you that's fine thank you thank you Councillor Neitzer, you had a, another question. Yeah, I have two left, and I will echo the admiration and appreciation because I'm sure it's not always an easy job because I'm sure you get to be the bad guy. 
many times or be perceived as the bad guy. Um, so can you explain, I think it's good for people to know it's something that we learned, I learned. Um, so if we make a change, that is one year, correct? I mean, it may re, it's not, you know, if we, if we change it down, it might go right back to where it was before. Can you explain how that works? That is correct. A board value is only good for one year. We may choose to leave it. Actually, you know, if we have a good reason, maybe that property needs to be looked at, we'll go look at that property and maybe we can adjust it so they don't have to appeal it every year. But actually, a lot of the appeals that you're going to be seeing next week are people that had board values that we have removed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other thing, and, and I promise I will not be offended at the answer to this, but I'm just very curious because it came up last year. Do you recall if you appealed? Because I believe you have the power to appeal our ruling yes. as well. Were, were some of those uh, appealed or not? Do you I do. Numbers? I don't believe we did. Okay. <laughs> we do. It, here's, here's why. Because our job, once again, is equalization. So if you have a, here's an example that happened last year. Um, if you have a development that we put values on and they're equal, and then we have somebody comes in and appeals a group of those values and they get lowered, you just unequalize that whole development. So that is why I would appeal those values back to the county board because of the unequalness in that development. Same on a single family home. If, if a home is, we're very strong and feel that our value is, is correct, we have the supporting documentation and it gets lowered for whatever reason, I may appeal it back. Yeah, and just to repeat again, I am not offended nope. whatsoever. You're just as like any other party, you have certain rights and it's your job to try to make sure things are equal. And of course we make mistakes. So, but it, just something that was, you know, remember it was questioned last mm -hmm. year. So I just wanted to ask about that. Thanks. I'll just consider it this way, Councillor Neitzer. We provide the county board with, with work and thus we provide them uh, with job security. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Councillor Staley. Um, well, yeah. Uh, in addition to that, now, Carla, I was going to ask you, what percentage of our decisions did you overturn? Last year, it was, um, it was very low. I will tell you, it was very low percentage of appeals that I appealed back because we had not reappraised. Everything was fairly unequal to begin with. Well, and so we, now that we've been in and the 5,000 parcels that we have now equalized. But, but I, I do have to say that we wouldn't have this board if, if we weren't offering uh, um, that chance for citizens to appeal. So it right. means there, there has to be an opportunity for it. So that's, that's where we correct. have the good. And some of us may be more compassionate or kind of open to that. Other people say, well, this is how it is. So maybe that's why we've got a mix of people on it, which is government at its best, of course. But the other thing, the question I have is, uh, and why, why are there, and I'm, I'm happy to serve, I mean, and the public needs to know, I mean, we gave 20 some hours last year. Why does the city council have, I think we have to have five there, and the school district has one, when the bulk of our property taxes are going to the school district, it, I, we were just told we get like 30%. So I was just curious as to why there's just one school board member there and all of us, we're really committing a big chunk of time. Could you answer that? Basically, the that's law. state law. <laughs> it's the law. Hmm. Yes. That's the law. That, that's, that the city, but, so any city council, all the city councils across the state are hearing these. All yes. city and township boards, local yeah, boards, are required right. to have a school board, may, may have a school board and in attendance, but the key thing is they have to have a quorum. That's what state law says. Of that entity? Yes, of that board. You can't, so you, we couldn't have half and half with school board and? No. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I can yes, throw in Council one more. Star. Is there any process, as part of your process, is compassion included as part of that, or is it the facts of what the property's <laughs> worth and comparable sales? And that's probably as rhetorical as it is. 
anything else. I mean, we for are, me, it's not about being uh, compassionate or not being compassionate. It's whether there were qualified and trained appraisers have a chance to, to look at factual things. Right. People's individual circumstances aren't factored into state statute. Right. It's the, the fact of what things are worth or not worth and whether a trained appraiser did a good job or if there are comparable uh, properties that can be used as part of that. So it's not a compassionate process. Right. Thank you. Can I, can I just put one more presentation up for everybody? This was a, a document submitted by the South Dakota Department of Revenue um, back in 2006. Everything still applies, although some of the numbers, um, I, I gave you the entire booklet in your booklet that I submitted on Friday, but there is no such thing as a tax break. There are, are only tax shifts. If the director of equalization lowers an assessed value from 500,000 to 400,000, the taxes associated with that $100,000 of value do not simply disappear. They get shifted amongst other properties. So that's very similar to what the local boards of equalization. When you lower those values, those taxes don't go away, only on yours, the ones that are appealing, but the rest of the tax burden gets distributed amongst everybody else. And that's, that's why I wanted to highlight that for you. I'm not trying to discourage you from lowering values. The simplicity of it is listen to their defense. Let's listen to our, our defense, then make a decision. That's all we ask. One more. Well, well, just one more. Well, uh, now I'm going to say I'm going to go back to compassion because I remember last year I think we heard about someone who had like termites eating on their house, and I mean there were there were some. Well, we're going to have some hear about some people who've had some hardships happening. So we could say, well, according to the law, it has to go here. I think there's some give and take here. We're listening, and we have to take it all into consideration. Each, each case is different. So that's what I'm saying is because if, if, if it's just cut and dried, then why even have it? We just take your, our experts' right. word for it. So the fact that we even allow them to come up means that we have to be taking that input and listening. So right. we, we assess the property, not the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor Neitzer. Thank you, and I appreciate the kind heart, and I will just finish with this. When I was on the Board of Adjustment, we had multiple cases, and I will give you one in particular. We had a lady who came up, she was eight months pregnant, and she was in tears because she wanted to put an addition onto her house because she was about to have a baby. The house was getting, was, they were running out of room. And, but the problem was they were in a flood zone, and so uh, we voted on it. Uh, it passed four to one. I was a one no vote. And everybody came up to me after the meeting, everybody being, you know, people that were on the board. How in the world could you vote against a eight-month pregnant lady? You know, what? You were just awful, cold-hearted. A couple months later, the city gets a letter from FEMA saying, you need to knock that off. You can't be granting additions in a flood zone. So... And, and, and the other thing that I've always, when, when I was on the Board of Adjustment, the thing that I always reminded myself was, this person right in front of me is asking me for a variance, and I need to follow the strict letter of the law, because is it fair to everybody else if I give this person an exception when everybody else has to follow the zoning code and the law? There needs to be a very good reason, and um, we, it's very tempting, but we have to be really careful about balancing the compassion for everybody and also trying to make sure we follow the law. So, but I, I appreciate the kind heart. It's, it comes from a good place, but I would just share that. Okay, very good. Councilor Selberg. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I would just add, that's probably the best tip you can give to reiterate to people is bring as many, as much supporting information for your argument as you can. Because yes, there's mm -hmm. a human element to it. Everybody's got a different story, but for the most part, if you've got eight, nine, ten, or however many facts to back up what you're saying, it's sure going to help your cause. And yes, there is a human element to them, and I think that's why we're all there to hear about different stories or the X factor. But it'd be nice if they brought that number two. It's nice if they show up. It surprised me last year how many people were outraged and, and uh, they were going to, sh you know, they had a problem with their number and they didn't show up. Any idea what the percentage is on that? I'm no, but a lot of what we hear from those folks that don't show up, 
the first step is the local board. So if they live in Sioux Falls, they have to appeal to the local board. A lot of them are snowbirds, they're still down south, but they want to submit their appeal to the local boards so they can go on to county board because they're going to be back by that time. Hmm. So that's what we hear. Right. Do you have the same? Yeah, we have a lo very low percentage of people that don't show up. Yeah, I don't, it wasn't like a huge number, it just no. every yeah. day there'd be a handful and yeah. it surprised me. So anyway, thank you. Hey, Diane and Carla, thank you very much. Uh, I know that uh, it is a challenge for us because we're not professionals at this. You are. And it is always difficult when you have somebody that's appealing and you can tell that they're people of need, but we do have to remain as factual as we possibly can, base our decisions on the fact, not on the fact that they didn't do the upgrades to the house that they should have been. For instance, how many times do we hear, well, it needs a new roof and the siding is poor? Well, that's part of home ownership. It's your responsibility. Make sure that you continue to replace that as needed. So thank you very much. Thank and you. we will be seeing you next week. You bet. Thank you. All right. That, br <laughs> that brings us to our last uh, <laughs> item. Yeah. And that is the top 10 projects update. Mr. Uh, Tom Huber, Assistant Director of Finance, is going to be presenting. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. Tom Huber again with the Finance Office. Uh, it's been about six months since we uh, last uh, reviewed the uh, status or a quick update on the uh, or a big picture overview of the top 10 projects that uh, are going on around the city uh, that have a significant impact on moving the city forward. Uh, first need to be very uh, cognizant of our team, uh, Deborah, Aaron, and Scott, that do an excellent job of managing these projects and keeping, keeping them moving forward. Uh, there are also many, many, many more people behind the scenes that every day are making good things happen around here on these projects and, and many others. Some of these receive more focus on an ongoing basis uh, at informational meetings or different times. Uh, so it's no accident that I'll skip over those a little bit faster and focus a little more time on some of those projects that don't uh, get a lot of uh, attention uh, on an ongoing basis. Quick look at a couple past projects that uh, have come off the top 10 projects list. Uh, the uh, InterGov land management uh, system, kind of the data hub for all things, plans, permits, uh, licensing, zoning, code enforcement, uh, is uh, fully implemented. We continue to add additional uh, capabilities to the system, rolling out additional citizen self-service aspects of it for uh, people to use online, and uh, the project continues to pay big dividends in uh, our capability to work uh, more efficiently and, uh, again, online access. Midco Aquatic Center is in its second full year of operations, just hosted the Summit League, uh, uh, swimming and diving championships, so uh, everything uh, going very well at the Midco Aquatic Center, getting, getting lots of good use. Tobacco-free initiative uh, adopted the smoke-free ordinance uh, for our parks and other facilities and rolled out a campaign to uh, promote a healthier, healthier environment. And then lastly, uh, in the completed project, subdivision annexation, uh, promoting uh, orderly growth uh, has, been, uh, has been finalized and uh, uh, providing guidance to staff on continuing to uh, work on the timing of annexations and uh, making sure those come in on the uh, communicating with property owners and come in on an orderly fashion. A quick uh, rundown of the current top 10 projects. You'll see uh, uh, six of them are co construction related and four are technology and some are people related. So uh, I'll review these in more detail, but uh, uh, again, uh, both of them expanding our capabilities, uh, meeting future, future needs, uh, quality of life improvements, uh, enhancing our ability to serve customers, uh, improving our employee productivity, uh, decision making and sharing information. New to this list are the last two on the construction side, Levitt Shell uh, and the Water Reclamation Master Plan and on the technology side, Asset Management. Starting with the first, uh, the fleet management system. Again, the, it's a simple <coughs> formula. Uh, modernize and centralize the, the fleet operations to capture efficiencies, uh, control costs, and improve services. 
uh, it's placed in the technology column because it's really leveraging uh, the tech, uh, adding technology and uh, the team that's in place, of dedicated hardworking people to really make good things happen. Uh, the fleet team has been centralized underneath uh, central services. Uh, we've successfully implemented uh, the base modules for the AssetWorks uh, fleet software system. Uh, we're in the process of procuring uh, their integrated fuel software. Uh, ensure those two work, uh, work well together and uh, again, make us a little more efficient, or a lot more efficient on sharing data and uh, improving our productivity. And combining the right, right people and the right technology is going to certainly improve how we, uh, how we can provide better services, do it more efficiently, and uh, uh, just uh, enhance how we do it and what we do and, and uh, keep us moving forward. Another project, uh, we successfully launched the uh, public safety software, uh, the Zerker suite uh, of software that, we, that was purchased, uh, went live on February 28th. Uh, I think two major takeaways from this project. One is the implementation uh, was a resounding success, uh, big part to the stars on there, all the hardworking people that were involved in this project from the city, from the county, Minneapolis County, from the city of Brandon and Metro Communications. Uh, Lots of hard work by everyone that was involved. Uh, was it perfect? Uh, I don't think any software ever, implementation ever comes off as being, everything being absolutely perfect, but there, all the issues were small and nothing uh, of showstopper status. And unless you worked in, the best news is this, unless you worked in dispatch or in public safety, uh, you never, never even knew it really happened. But we upgraded, the, or we changed out the whole CAD system for the city uh, and county. Um, also, if you are looking for a, uh, how partnerships should work in government, uh, you really need to look no further than this, than this project. It really was a collaborative effort uh, between all four of these entities. Um, and top it off, uh, Zerker's a local company, and uh, we'll, the team will be able to leverage uh, that aspect of it to hopefully drive them forward by adding value-added enhancements that are good for both the company and uh, the, the public. Public safety facility study. Uh, this is an independent assessment of the public safety training facility, uh, fire station placement and utilization, uh, fire service delivery, and police uh, report to work locations. Uh, the uh, project is just wrapping up uh, pending final reports. Uh, once the reports are, all the final reports are received and finalized, we'll begin to uh, uh, review the results and appropriately program uh, any changes into the upcoming capital program and the ongoing operating budgets. So uh, much more on this to come soon. City administration building, everybody's well aware of this project, uh, remains on schedule and under budget. Uh, finished work is well underway as are plans for moving people uh, into the new building. Next use uh, parking ramp, again, uh, work is, is continuing storm right with the storm drain relocation and the beginning of, of design development on this project. Rail yard redevelopment, uh, redevelopment plan has been completed. Uh, proposals have been received and reviewed and uh, currently finalizing the first development agreement and re re uh, receiving bids uh, for uh, the rail yard cleanup process. What Works City, you just received a presentation on this last week. Uh, so uh, as you heard, the city is taking full advantage of uh, the opportunity to work with uh, John Hopkins University and the Sunlight Foundation, uh, both partners in What Works Cities, to strengthen our data practices. Uh, and we'll continue to uh, add information and data sets as part of this project. Three new projects have been added to the list. Uh, You've seen this one before in budget presentations, but uh, it's, uh, it's a project that's going on for a while, but it's finally uh, uh, getting to the stage where software will be procured in the, in, in the very near future. Uh, it's a great opportunity for, uh, and maybe one of the biggest yet, as far as software goes, for us to deploy modern technology uh, to move uh, the city forward. 
Uh, it touches almost every department, uh, especially those with heavy emphasis on infrastructure. As you can see, all the pieces of it, and these are just a few, uh, from water to sewer lines, streets, buildings, uh, to playgrounds, sports complexes, parking lots, and even on down to signs and sprinkler lines. The, there's just a significant amount of infrastructure that's both above and below ground, and uh, a tremendous value-added opportunity to work smarter, uh, proactive uh, way we manage assets, uh, streamlining business processes, and, and uh, uh, adding mobile uh, access to this uh, for, for our employees. Uh, to again work smarter, uh, consolidate data and collaborate across all departments uh, to prove decision making and the list could go on and on and on. Change management obviously will be a, a vital component of this one because it's also going to change how, how we work. Uh, Levitt Shell of Sioux Falls, a uh, great example of a public uh, private partnership that will have a most definite impact uh, on our community. Uh, partnership between the city, the local Friends of Levitt, and the National Levitt Foundation. I think everybody is uh, aware of this project, but uh, for those who may be watching, you know, 50 free outdoor performances per year put on by the Friends of Levitt at a great venue in Fall, Falls Park West. I personally find this one very exciting and can't wait to see the first show take off sometime in uh, the summer of 2019. Uh, the bid award is on the consent agenda tonight to, uh, to keep that project moving forward and groundbreaking in the spring. Last project, the Water Reclamation Master Plan. Uh, Director of Public Works Mark Cotter uh, has introduced some preliminary information on this project, uh, but is uh, scheduled to provide a complete review at the uh, March 27th informational meeting. Uh, as you can see, this project uh, is all about uh, proactive planning to meet the city's water reclamation needs. Uh, not just for today, but well into the future. So uh, I won't go into any further uh, information on that as Mark will be coming up before you in a couple weeks. Again, a great lineup of projects that will keep us moving forward uh, for years to come. And these are just a few of the many, many things that go around the city, going on around the city. And that's why I like working for the city, a varied group of projects that there's always something new and exciting going on and happening and all the services that we can provide to the community and, and, and the public. So you can follow these on our website and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tom. Questions? Councillor Neitzer? One question. Do we have any estimated date that the first people will actually start to move in to the admin building and be working in there? I don't uh, have the exact dates. Uh, I think that's still open, but sometime I would guess later spring, whether it be end of May or mid mid May, end of May, early June. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Seeing none. Thank you, Tom, for the you. good pre presentation. We do appreciate it. Well, that is the last item on our uh, agenda. The uh, Public Services Committee will start at uh, 527, 10 minutes from now, 527. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>